guys, welcome back to Tiny Fibre Studio. This is episode 16 of a podcast about knitting, spinning, and specifically me trying to be a little bit more purposeful with my spinning. In this episode, I have some finished projects to catch you up on. Spoiler. Um, I also wanted to recap my Wonderwool experience. That was last weekend. I'll talk about what I've got on the spinning wheel at the moment and some homey housey stuff at the end. First things first, let's talk about the giant elephant in the room, the giant grello elephant in the room, which is Strocker, which I finished in, I think about three weeks. It would have been a lot quicker, but I blocked the body separately to make sure that it wasn't gonna be really overly long. I don't think it is, I feel like it's quite a nice comfy length when I'm standing up. I did also think that the sleeves had come out really long but actually now I don't think they have. I think that's a good length. Um, possibly just because when the creases start coming in from like the elbows and just your, your natural movement I think the, the sleeves tend to kind of shrink up a little bit. So I am really happy with this. It's really comfortable, it's really warm. I have worn it pretty much every day since I finished it and I will almost certainly be knitting another because the yarn is really reasonable. Um, this is Let Lopey and I would definitely make another one probably in the ocean blue colour as the main colour which is kind of a navy slightly tealy blue. I don't know about the contrast colours yet. I think I've probably got enough of the light grey that I wouldn't have to order any more of that. I'm not sure about the yellow I would possibly change that to maybe an orange with the navy blue, I don't know. I haven't really planned it yet, but it's definitely something that I will be doing. Strocker was a really easy knit. Uh, it did take my hands a little while to get used to thicker yarn again, <laughs> because I'd been working on another project that I'll show you in a moment, and switching over to this one was kind of like my hands were just kind of going, what What am I doing here? I felt like I was knitting with roving or something. It felt really, really weird to start with. But once I got into the flow of it, it went really quickly. And yeah, about two and a half, three weeks and it was done. I don't really think that there are any modifications that I would make. The only thing possibly would be that the neckline is a little tiny bit high. I would like it maybe about four rows lower, but I don't know whether there's enough room to do the short row shaping in between that and the top of the pattern. Um, it's not a massive deal, I, I don't hate it, but I think if you were sensitive to this wool against your skin, which I was initially, but I've got used to it now, um, possibly if you were sensitive to it, it might be an issue, but um, I, I don't think I'm that worried that if it wasn't possible to do the short row shaping, I don't think it would prevent me from doing the project again. So that was Strocker. It's really nice, really easy, really quick, um, very warm. I'm not precious about it, so I wear it around the cats all the time because let's be honest, with Let Lopey, who's gonna see cat hair, right? Um, the same is not so true of this other finished project which is Ishnana. Now, those of you who are familiar with Ishnana might notice that there are some changes because I completely swapped out the cable pattern on the back for the lace pattern that is one of the options for the sleeve and the front. So it's the same lace pattern all the way through. I just, I've said this before, I'll quite happily say it again, the cable pattern just reminded me of something else and I have one of those something else's and it's great, but I don't necessarily want it on the back of my cardigan. <laughs> so uh, I swapped it out for the lace pattern. I think it still works absolutely fine. Um, it probably has a little bit more give in it than was intended with the cable pattern, but I'm, I'm fine with that. My only frustration with this pattern was actually not with the pattern at all, just with my finishing. And that was that when I did the neckband, I redid the neckband probably about four times, trying to get 
the very edge of the neck band to line up properly with the edge of the button band. And when I blocked it, there's still this one, which is really annoying. It's just curving in a little bit and that kind of stuff just really drives me insane. So I may just have to block that again. And I think if I block it aggressively enough, it will probably be okay. This one does attract cat hair like you would not believe, but it's certainly not something that I would be wearing around the cats. So I'm not too concerned about that one. Um, this is from Vulmi's Lace. It's supposed to be knit with four ply slash socks slash fingering weight, but I kind of feel like Vulmi's Lace is so far towards sock weight that it's kind of interchangeable and it's worked out okay for me on this pattern. My intention was to get buttons for it at Wonderwool. Normally I can go to one specific stand and I can pretty much guarantee that I can find buttons for basically anything at that stand. Not so. On this occasion I couldn't find anything that I felt really worked so I didn't get anything at all. I will have to try um, some other places that I'm aware of to see if I can find something that I think works with it. Otherwise, next time I'm in London, there's a button shop in Marlebone. I've been there before. I went there for buttons for my Leica cardigan. And they're basically a button shop that have thousands of different kinds of buttons. They work with the film and TV industry and with costume makers from all the West End theatres and all that sort of stuff. And they literally have thousands of buttons. So you can just give them a colour and they will bring you a folder full of samples of these buttons. Um, you can tell them a style or a type of button and they'll bring you folders. It's, um, it's great and I, I enjoyed the experience of trying to find buttons for Leica. So uh, it would be fun if I have to get to that stage. It would be kind of fun to do that again for this one. Ishnana has been on the needles for a very, very, very long time. I think it's about four years. Um, not proud of it. <laughs> when I left it before the uh, Handspun 17, I think I was probably up to about there on the sleeve. So I didn't really have that much left to do, just the rest of the sleeve and the button bands. But yeah, it took a while to get it finished, but it's almost finished. Apart from obviously some end weaving, I did end weave a little bit on the Wonderwall coach, but uh, I didn't quite get that finished. I did get through a lot of them though, so I think there's only about three or four to go, unless there are any hiding on the inside. I think it's about four to go. So there we go, that is that one, and I'm really, really happy with it. I did make some modifications, so I don't think I added any more extra rows after the end of the shaping on the sleeves, because the sleeves were looking pretty long as it was, and I just thought if I add another however many rows I was supposed to knit, it was going to come out really, really, really long. So I just omitted those and just did the ribbing. But apart from that, I think it was pretty much as it was written, apart from the modification of the, the lace in place of the um, cable. So yeah, two projects finished. Can you believe it? Um, that's an insane amount of productivity for me in uh, the way that my mojo has been the last year or so. That's kind of crazy to have two finished projects to show you. So I'm very happy about that. On the needles at the moment, is, wait for it, the doodler. So this, if you remember, is one of the things that I started at least dyeing the fibre for in Handspun 17. I can't even remember whether I actually started spinning it or not, but we are, I think, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 10, 11, 12, 13. I am 13 wedges into the pattern, really enjoying it actually. I'm not going to spoil the pattern for anybody, but it's nice and easy to remember. 
So I can literally just pick it up whenever and start doing a little bit at work, you know, at lunchtime or something like that. It's nice and easy to remember. And I can generally get, up until now, certainly I've been able to get at least one wedge done each day. Obviously the wedges get bigger and bigger and bigger. So at some stage I will have to stop trying to get one done per day and just accept that I'm gonna get a lot less. I, interestingly, my yarn I thought was pretty consistent. Eh, not so much. <laughs> um, it is fairly thick in places and fairly thin in other places, but you know what? It's hand spun. It's not supposed to be perfect. And so I'm okay with that. Interestingly, I think it's only really the gray, the light gray that's really thick and thin. The rest of it seems to be pretty consistent. So I don't know what was going on at that point. Maybe I was just rushing to get it finished, but that's definitely the thicker of all of the yarns. The rest of them are fairly consistent. So yeah, I can just pick this up pretty much at any point and get a little bit done on it because it is so easy to remember. And that is my current project. So that's finished projects and what's on the needles at the moment. Um, I think next up, I'm gonna look at what I bought at Wonderwool. So Wonderwool was last weekend and I went up on a coach with a whole load of people from roughly the area where I live and we had a very very cold coach journey <laughs> up to Wales um bless him the, the driver kept saying like I've, I've got the heating on the heating's on as high as it will go but it's just not great heating it was freezing um I kept my gloves on and I had my my um, exploration station on the whole way and I was still really really cold so um, it was a bit of an uncomfortable journey up there, but I could deal with that for the fact that Wonderwall itself was amazing again. I haven't been to Wonderwall in about three or four years, probably four years. Um, when I was saving for the house deposit and all that kind of stuff, it just seemed silly to put temptation in my way where it wasn't really necessary so I haven't been for a while and this time I had a little bit of a list but not a huge amount and actually most of it was shopping for the 51 yarns videos so I will take you through what I bought at Wonderwall. So this is my haul from Wonderwall I'll talk about this bag first of all. This is from Kumsturdy Fibre Farm and it's 500 grams of raw mohair from a goat called Cadfile. Thank you very much Cadfile, I appreciate this. Uh, so this is the raw unwashed and then I have got some here that I've washed as well and it's lovely stuff. Uh, this is the fourth shear of CAD files fibre. So it's it's young mohair as opposed to kid mohair. Uh, but I wanted it really primarily for blending. Um, I do have something coming up that I might have to use locks for, but it's mostly for blending. This I only washed a day or two ago and it hasn't really had a chance to dry out yet. So it's still a little bit on the damp side, but lovely fibre lovely people as well. I think it was Debbie who bought a couple of her goats with her who were super cute. Um, there was a, a an adult goat and, and two kids as well. They were super, super cute. And yeah, lovely, lovely fibre. It's lovely and soft. Um, I can't wait to start blending this in with some other stuff or indeed using it on its own. So that was one of my purchases. I'll deal with that first just to be able to put that out of the way for a second. So the mohair was one of my purchases, but I just wanted to kind of talk that, talk about that and kind of get it physically out of the way so that I have more room to <laughs> talk about everything else that's in the bag. So the first thing that I 
ran in and grabbed as soon as I got to Wonderwall was the Ply Magazine 51 Yarns book because as you might know if you're subscribed to this channel I'm doing a video every week which corresponds with Ply Magazine's spin along topic which comes from this book so they have a spin along topic each week the idea is that everybody spins a yarn according to that topic and it comes from this book it's a very sweet little book. There are some really cute little illustrations. Um, I, I love that you can recognize characters of the, uh, the spinning world. Like I just flipped past Judith McKenzie there. Um, where did she go? Can't find her again, but Judith McKenzie's in there. There's, um, there's one of like Alden Amos, um, there's even a cute little angel bob from Ravelry. That's that was super cute. Uh, so it's beautifully illustrated. Um, the thing that is really important for me about this book is that I kind of feel like it's a syllabus for pushing me out of my comfort zone. I've looked before at the Certificate of Achievement in Spinning, which is run by the Guild of Weaver Spinners and Dyers in the UK. But that is something like two years of study and it's a lot of work. You have to, you know, present all this information and you have to have a final finished project. And I've seen some of those final finished projects and they're amazing. So I kind of don't really feel like I've got the time to devote to that at the moment, but I can manage doing a spin long each week. So... That was my first purchase. This copy came from The Threshing Barn. As far as I'm aware, they're the only people in the UK at the moment who have copies of this book. If you want to get a copy in the UK and you're concerned about import charges, just go straight through The Threshing Barn and then you don't have to worry about that because they've already paid the import charges. So that was my first purchase. Um, very cute and really important for me given what I'm doing at the moment. From that point on I can't really remember which order I did these in so I'm just gonna pull stuff out at random and you can see what I got. I didn't actually get my Sunflower Swift at Wonderwool but what I did find was a stand that had the longer pegs for the Sunflower Swift which is really cool. I only became aware of this a couple of years ago. Somebody pointed out that, oh, they do actually make longer pegs for it because the problem that you sometimes have is these pegs are perfectly fine for most commercial yarns. I think the only one I've ever really had a problem with was the Volmi's Lace because that comes in a massive, massive skein and trying to fit that on these pegs was a little bit tricky but they make these longer pegs see I haven't even undone these I've saved this just for you so if I undo this you just basically use these pegs in place of the shorter ones and it gives you a much much bigger area so if you tend to spin either a lot of yarn or quite chunky then this is definitely a very very useful idea i'll hang on to the shorter versions as well but i think these will probably go on the swift and stay on there pretty much the whole time now so that was one little fortuitous purchase like i say i wasn't really planning on getting that but it was handy that i spotted it i also spotted some gotland from john arban i've been kind of looking to spin gotland for a while now and I keep forgetting to buy any of it. Be kind of useful, right? So I grabbed, I think it's about 200 grams of this. No idea what I'm gonna do with it, but I was just interested to try a bit of spinning with Gotland. And the next thing is when I was at Edinburgh, you might remember that I talked about spinning on the Schacht flat iron, which was um, bought to Edinburgh by Weftblown. They were really, really lovely. And because I own a shacked wheel, I always want to try and support people who sell shacked and shacked accessories. Um, 
but I actually have pretty much everything that I feel I need for that wheel right now. So I was desperately racking my brains trying to think what can I buy that I actually need. And they also stock Louette and specifically they stock Louette fine hand carders. Especially a few times recently I've thought about carding fibres like alpaca and I've got some angora and cotton and various other things. And I've thought, oh, actually, I don't have anything that's really designed for processing fine fibres. So I decided to pick up a pair of Louette hand cards. I haven't had a chance to try these out yet. And I need to find some sort of spare fibre to work through these hand cards. Little tip for these. Um, use scrap fibre the first time you use them because they can have bits of oil and little teeny teeny tiny burrs of metal and so on on there when they're straight out of the factory. So if you get new hand cards, make sure you use some waste fibre before you use anything really fancy. So that was my only real kind of tool purchase of this year. Um, I don't really count the swift pegs as a tool, but I guess you could say they are. This is actually something that technically I did not buy at Wonderwall, but I spotted it at Wonderwall and it kind of reminded me that I should buy it. I saw it on a stand and I thought, right, I'm going to come back to that. On my second trip round, I couldn't find that stand again. I couldn't remember which one it was. So apologies, whoever had this on their stand and I didn't buy them, buy it from them. I did end up doing this from Amazon. Um, this is Knit One, Bike One. And basically the reason that I'm interested in it is because it's a sort of travelogue of a bicycle trip around Scotland, taking in lots of different um, fiber arts and connecting with lots of textile artists. And it is done on a Brompton folding bicycle. And I have one of those. So there's sort of an instant sisterhood or brotherhood when you see somebody else who has a Brompton. It's kind of like, you know that your brains kind of work in a, a sort of vaguely similar way. Um, I have the Brompton World Championships coming up, which I will be riding in, which is very exciting. Um, not that I'm particularly fast or anything, I just, got a place in the ballot but I thought that would be kind of a nice book to read that combines two interests of mine so that was a slightly post Wonder Wall purchase and then we get on to the really fun stuff so I did mention that my primary goal of going to Wonder Wall this year was to try to make sure that I had all of the fibre necessary for at least the next six months or so of the 51 yarns challenge. So I looked ahead and I had a list of all the topics that I didn't have supplies for. And there was one of those that I kind of felt could be um, part of a wider project. So in a few weeks time, there's a topic of self striping. And then a little way further down the line, there's another one for fractal. And I thought it'd be kind of interesting to see how basically the same fibre spun up when it was self-striping versus when it was fractal. So I bought two braids of this fibre by Hilltop Cloud. This is 70% Superwash Cheviot, 15% uh, Tussa Silk and 15% Nylon. It's 120 grams. And I have been spinning with some of it already. It's, it's on my wheel over here. I'll show it to you a little bit more in just a moment. And I really, really like this fibre. It's lovely and shiny. You can see the, the silk and the nylon giving a little bit of sheen. So this and the other braid were basically identical. And the idea is I will spin the first one is self-striping and the second one is fractal and you'll be able to see how they come out. Hilltop Cloud is one of those dyers whose work I really, really appreciate, but because I dye my own fibre and I've dyed quite a lot in the last couple of years, I haven't really bought very much of hers. But there's a couple of things that I wanted to just point out that I think are really useful when it comes to buying fibre from indie dyers. 
and this is something that I really appreciate about her work, is this is very clearly intended to be a sock yarn. It's superwash cheviot, it's silk, and it's nylon. Those three combinations, like you couldn't possibly get something that is more intended as a sock yarn. So I love that she has done 120 grams of this rather than the standard 100. Because if you're doing socks, I don't know about any of you, but I struggle to get 100 grams worth of sock yarn that will actually do a pair of socks when it's my hand spun. 120 just gives me that extra little bit of leeway. And I really, really appreciate that about Hilltop Cloud. Um, I also met her mum. So Katie Weston runs Hilltop Cloud. Her mum, Elaine, runs a shop called Quince Pie on Etsy. And she does really awesome project bags, hand carder covers, interchangeable needle uh, organisers. And I am going to get her to do a custom order for me so that I can fit all of my interchangeable tips in one organiser. And then there'll be a separate organiser for cables. And I'm probably also going to get a couple of hand carder covers from her as well. So that was all in all a very, very worthwhile trip to the Hilltop Cloud stand. And then really the rest of my bag is entirely full of little sample bags. Actually, there's one other thing that I forgot here, which was from Hilltop Cloud, and that was hand-dyed silk laps. They're just gorgeous. It's kind of like rusty orange with teal, and it's just beautiful. I love it. Love, love, love. So that will probably get blended into a bat at some stage. That was the actual last thing I bought on the Hilltop Cloud stand. And then, yeah, the rest of it is all sample packs. But I will talk you through why I bought some of these. One of the things on the 51 yarns list is luxury fibres. And I don't think, I think I have some camel and silk somewhere. But apart from that, I don't really have very much that I consider luxury. So I was looking at buying 100 grams of cashmere partially just because as soon as I put my hands anywhere near it, it was like they were on fire. It was so warm that I just thought mm, maybe I should just get some of this to wrap around my hands on the coach journey home if it's going to be as cold as it was coming up. here. <laughs> um, however, common sense prevailed and I ended up picking up some sample packs of luxury fibres, which are camel down, carded cashmere, brown cashmere, and yak. So sample packs of each of those. Those were from Wingham's, who I actually bought my ash for joy from back in the day. There's also a topic on 51 yarns for bast. I actually had to look that up because I didn't, I didn't know what bast was. <laughs> What they mean by that is like plant fibres. So I bought some flax and some linen for the bast week. I have got some linen somewhere else, but I could only find one colour of it. And I didn't want to spin that knowing that somewhere I have another colour. I don't know where, can't find it right now. It'll be around. So yeah, linen and flax. And then finally, I got some silk for blending. So I have two little packs of sari silk in quite different colourways. I was kind of inspired by my friend Yvonne who was on the Wonderwall coach with me. Um, she spun some really beautiful fibre and wove it into a skirt that has some sari silk in it as well. So I thought that would be kind of fun to blend with other fibres in a bat, maybe. And then I also got some gold, teal and pistachio silk samples. Again, there is a week of 51 yarns that's specifically for silk. 
so there we go. That was the sum total of my purchases at Wonderwall. I thought I did pretty well, I was fairly restrained, um, but I also got to hang out with uh, my friend Katie. If you haven't seen it already, go and check out her podcast. Uh, she is Katie from the Green Bean podcast. I will put a link in the description down below. She is just the most fantastic, talented, wonderful, lovely individual. So she and I met at a knit night probably about three years ago. And I'm struggling with how to say this, but I hope you will understand what I mean when I say this. She instantly just jumped out as being one of my people in the sense that in amongst lots of people knitting and crocheting with some form of cheap acrylic yarn, she had a Kate Davis book open and she was knitting something from that with proper wool. <laughs> and I just, I kind of spotted her across the table and I was like, hmm, we, we could potentially be friends. Like she has a good taste in yarn and patterns and everything and we could potentially be friends. So anyway, we've been friends for a few years now and she has created a podcast in the last month or so. Uh, I think she put out her first episode just before Edinburgh and it's called the Green Bean Podcast. It is beautifully chilled and relaxing and it is just like being in her house and you know watching her create stuff and she talks very deeply about the process. Um, it is a lovely podcast. I highly recommend that you go and have a look if you haven't already. So anyway, Katie and I get to see each other whenever our paths coincide at our knitting group. But because of my job and her job, we don't always kind of cross paths. So it's been really lovely both at Edinburgh and Wonderwall to get to spend a little bit of time with her and go shopping. <laughs> take those little opportunities that she has to kind of run around the show and, and go and grab stuff that she's um, spotted. So it was really nice. She and the Black Yarns team got an award for their stand, which was fantastic because it did look very professional and beautiful. So I'm very glad that they got that award. So generally just a, a really good day at Wonderwall was had by all. Um, Thank you to Yvonne for being my seat mate on the coach and also to the organisers of the coach trip because without that I wouldn't be able to get to these things very easily. It would take a, a much larger chunk of my time to get there. So thank you all very much for that. Since Wonderwool, I have got something on the spinning wheel, which is the first of the Hilltop Cloud braids. And you can see there is still more to come. This is kind of a crazy colour for me. I feel like it's really out of character. And to be fair, I, I don't think it's massively in character for Katie who dyes it either. But um, it is spinning up really beautifully. I've got uh, a few little samples here. These are my ply back tests. And one of these, the purple one, I've actually already um, soaked and dried. So they're coming up really, really nicely. The idea of that is going to be to spin it and then chain ply it. And then with the second lot, I will be doing a, I haven't decided yet whether it's going to be a two ply or a three ply, but it will be a fractal on that spin. So that is pretty much everything in terms of fibery knitty stuff. So I promised that I would update you a little bit on housey stuff as well. So I got thinking, I was, I was off work yesterday as well, so I've had two days off in a row, which rarely happens, but it's great when it does. And yesterday I started to think about what I needed to do and buy in order to get the house kind of the way that I want it and to be able to use the rooms the way that I want to. And that was partly triggered by the fact that IKEA opens its first store in Devon in 
about a week's time. Now, I know some people love Ikea and some people hate it. I'm kind of a fan for certain things. And what I didn't want to do was to go into Ikea and just be like, I'm buying all of the stuff and just, you know, randomly buy things that I don't really need. So I wanted to come up with a list and measurements and everything so that I had a little bit of a focused mindset when I get in there. So one of the rooms that I haven't yet sorted out or started using as I actually want to use it is the craft room. The craft room is currently the cat's room because there are times when they need to be shut away in a room to keep them safe or to um, allow me to do things like setting up lights and having fiber and stuff all around without having to shoo them off it every three seconds so right now the craft room is their room but there will come a point hopefully where it will be a little bit more easy for me to um, have them out in the rest of the house when I'm at work so at that point I want to start using the craft room as a craft room and it will also be where they sleep as well but you know I wanted to try and get the furniture and anything else that I need in there to make it work the way that I want it to. So I went and played around with some different furniture layouts and all of that stuff. So in terms of fibre storage I have the Expedit 2x4 unit which is now known as Calax. it's a slightly different version but it's that cube storage so I have eight sections in there that I can theoretically store my fibre in. The problem is I started storing it in the cat's room while they were in there and it was totally fine for weeks and weeks and weeks and then suddenly Safi decided to start pulling those totes out getting into the fibre, chewing through plastic bags to get to the fibre. And I was just like, oh God, I, you know, if she gets into those, that's just going to be horrific. Not only for my fibre, but obviously if she's having to chew through plastic bags to get to it, that's not good for her either. So I need to try and find fibre storage boxes that will fit in those units that she can't get into, that she can't pull out. So that's one thing on the list when Ikea opens. The other thing that will probably happen is I've got a, a chair, like a sort of mid-century style chair, and um, one of the tables from a nest of tables that will go upstairs, and that will be a little sitting area. I have some good views from this house, so I want to be able to make the most of them. And it will also probably be where I end up podcasting from as well, because there'll be some nice natural light coming in. And if that's the case, I won't have to set up the two massive uh, softbox lights that I've got set up at the moment. I will just be able to set my camera up and be able to record from uh, natural light, which would be fantastic. So that was storage and seating. But the other thing that I wanted to have a look at was a desk space because at the moment I do my editing at the kitchen table which is actually a breakfast bar and the stools are kind of high and they kind of make me sort of hunch over a lot when I'm editing which is obviously not good so I started thinking about desks and then the idea of a bureau came around. Ikea do at least one there's there's one that's part of the Hemnes range and I was looking at that that is about 200, 250-ish. And when I started Googling around, there were some people who were like, mm, actually, it's not great build quality and we kind of wish that we hadn't got it. So I started looking at some vintage options instead because I have a couple of bits of vintage furniture in here already. The nest of tables that you will sometimes see in my videos is a G-Plan Quadril and I also have a G-Plan Fresco sideboard, like a big sideboard with tons of storage in it, including cutlery drawer, which is amazing. So I started looking at G-Plan. G-Plan don't really have a lot in the way of actual desks, although a lot of people repurpose the dressing tables as a desk instead. But there was an Urkel desk 
that I really loved. It's part of the Windsor range and it's just, it's gorgeous, but they go for insane amounts of money. You know, approaching a thousand pounds for these things and they're not very easy to come by. So instead I started looking at the Bureau version which actually was originally designed as a serving cabinet. <laughs> um, this was in the 1950s, probably. So, you know, the, the age of sort of entertaining at home and giving terribly posh cocktail parties and that kind of thing. And the idea was that you would have your china and things stored in there and you would bring out um, the food, you know, the soup or whatever from the kitchen and you would actually serve it from your serving cabinet. And it has a drop leaf that's supposed to be used for carving. Obviously, not very many people now really use a serving cabinet because we just, you know, either dish stuff up in the kitchen and just take the plates into the dining room or you just, you know, bring out the food onto the dining table and serve it up there. So, you know, it's not really necessary to have a serving cabinet as such. So a lot of people use these as desks. I was kind of looking around on eBay and I spotted this Urkel Bureau for sale. And I was looking at the photo and I was like, I recognise that flooring. So this morning I popped down to the shop and I love this guy. He's been so helpful with um, things like letting me know which courier he used so that I could get my um, sideboard delivered. And I was like, I finally got this thing that I can actually buy from him again to support a nice local business. So yeah, I went there this morning and he actually shut his shop to be able to drive me and the sideboard back to my house and help me get it in the house. It is not as yet in the cat's room because I want to see how they behave around it first, but also because I want to be able to use it when the cats are in their room. There will be a couple of times during the week where I need to do that. So currently, it is here, it's, it's this big thing that you can see here. It's amazing, I've kind of kitted it out already and got things organised in there. So yeah, house-wise, it's starting to come together and I, I sort of feel like after the IKEA trip, once I've got all my fibre stored in that room, it's really just a question then of waiting for my stepdad to do the gates so that I can use my side room as an entrance and then the cats will be able to have access to everything and I will be able to use my craft room as a craft room and it'll all be great. So yeah, there we go. That is where I'm at at the moment. I hope this has been useful in some way, shape or form. I hope you enjoyed uh, hearing about Wonderwall and some of my finished projects. Coming up on 51 Yarns is Two Ply next up and then it goes into Tail Spinning. So it's a couple of fun episodes coming up. So I hope you'll be able to join me for those. If you are not already subscribed to this channel, I would absolutely love it if you would hit the subscribe button. That way you get informed when I upload a new video and you won't miss out on anything. So I hope that's been useful. In between now and the next episode, you can find me on Instagram as Tiny Fibre Studio and on Ravelry, I am Ibex. Hope this was useful and I will see you again next time.